Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Slack National Accelerator Lab. My name is Kelly Gaffney, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Xu Chong Zhang, who is a distinguished scientist and professor of physics here at the Stanford University and also a member of our Slack Stanford community. Uh, professor Zhang was born in China and had his formal education occur both in China at Fudan University, also in Germany at the Free University of Berlin and also at Stony Brook in New York. But I think more interesting with regard to, to his career was the informal education he had before, his, uh, before he entered university. So Professor Zhang was at the forefront of the intellectual reawakening that happened in China in the late 70s and early 80s. And because of this, in his early years, he was uh, self-taught to a great extent. And I think that this may be a piece of uh, why his scientific career is distinguished from many others, which is distinguished in large part by his creativity. So with that, I hope that that will be expressed in tonight's talk, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed a great uh, pleasure for me to share this uh, wonderful evening with you uh, today. Uh, actually, I'm keenly aware of who my competition is. Uh, before I came in here, I turned on the TV and I was so shocked. I was sure that no one would uh, come to my talk. Because, uh, but it looks like uh, today, uh, most of you are more uh, keenly uh, uh, aware of the uh, interested in the state of the universe rather than the state of the union. So, uh, so I have, yeah, I have been a professor at Stanford for 20 years. This is my first time I'm doing this. So this is indeed a great pleasure. And I hope that all, all of you can feel quite relaxed and we will share this evening uh, in, a, uh, in a relaxed pace so that we can uh, understand and so that I can share with you some of the exciting development in basic science. But usually, some of the uh, interest in basic science uh, concerns the far corners of the deep universe. But the topic today is actually very much at the center point of the prosperity of our Silicon Valley, or very home uh, today. So uh, I'm sure that many of you have seen uh, this graph many, many times. Actually, to a distinguished audience like uh, we have here today, I'm sure that some of you may even have contributed uh, to this so-called Moore's Law. So this is the law, uh, kind of a law of uh, economics and a law in the information age, which is responsible for the tremendous progress of the information age and also responsible for the prosperity of the United States and very much so of the Silicon Valley. So it basically was stated by Gordon Moore in the 60s. He observed that the number of transistors on a semiconductor chip when you really take your computer apart, you, feel, you, you kind of see that the size of your uh, semiconductor chip basically didn't change very much. It's almost uh, always a postage stamp size. But the number of transistors inside this chip doubles every 18 months. So this is a remarkable, remarkable phenomenon. Actually, ever since the human civilization, there has never been an industry that could innovate at such a rapid and exponentially growing pace. So you observe that so here is the number of years since he formulated, uh, maybe he formulated even back then in the 60s, uh, but here is what we call a logarithmic scale. So here we don't go from 1,000 to 2,000 and to 3,000, but we add a zero every time we go up in the vertical axis, counting the number of transistors on a semiconductor chip. And this is basically what is responsible for the tremendous progress, the things that we take for granted, that the iPhone today uh, had the power of uh, IBM mainframe computer of uh, yesterday. So this is the uh, thing that we have taken for granted, but there's every indication today that this law, this magic law of uh, progress of exponential explosion uh, of the information uh, age is coming to a standstill. It's a basically facing some fundamental crisis uh, that uh, we uh, will, if we go on in the regular paradigm of doing things as usual, we will not be able to keep up this, uh, with, uh, with this rapid progress. And that will be really sad, uh, both for Silicon Valley, for the progress of the information age, and so on. 
So the story I would like to tell you today is how scientists uh, are coming. Actually, uh, when Moore, Gordon Moore first formulated uh, this law, it was a moment, a starting point of a tremendous chapter of progress in human society. But to a certain extent, it was also a sad moment when science and technology parted on their own way because the relentless pursuit uh, of the Moore's law in the past 60 years mostly was due to technological innovation. Uh, not that much to do with basic science. But now we're facing such a crisis of such a magnitude that we have to rethink at a very basic scientific level how we can do things better so that we can keep the Moore's law uh, uh, from uh, uh, saving uh, the Moore's law so that it can always keep on going. So in order to understand what's the problem uh, and what was the progress and what's the problem uh, we're facing now today, let me go back to the very basics uh, of uh, the, uh, the most basic building blocks of the information age. So the information age is, can be reduced, the basic building block, to two elementary particles. One is the photon, which is the carrier of the light, and the other is the electron, which is the carrier of the basic logic processing inside a semiconductor chip. So basically, electron process the information and photons transmit this information. The reason why we give these two elementary particles two very different roles is because they have very, very drastically different properties. Photons basically interact with each other very, very weakly. If you're in a vacuum, if two, two photons meet, they don't even talk to each other. They don't notice each other's presence. So the, it's this very remarkable property of the photon, which is actually responsible for how we carry information at a very fast rate over very, very large distance. For example, there was a Nobel Prize awarded uh, to Charles Gall for fiber optical communication. Inside these optical fibers, it's all these photons which are zooming uh, around and uh, going from one uh, from uh, San Francisco to New York in uh, a split second, uh, but uh, this is all due to the fact that we can pack many, many photons into this fib op uh, fiber optical cable, and they barely uh, interfere with each other. They are not so perturbed or disturbed by their surroundings, uh, by the obstacles, and as a result, uh, they can carry information without much attenuation. So this is the magic property of the photon, one of the elementary particles that we have. The other is the electron, uh, or familiar uh, object, electrons. Uh, in, when you take an atom apart, there's the electron which goes around the atomic nucleus. Now, the electrons has the totally the opposite property. It interacts with each other very, very strongly. So basically, they repel each other. If you have the two electrons which carry the same charge, as you pack them, as the distance gets closer and closer and closer, they repel each other by a tremendous amount. It is this uh, interaction, this very strong interaction, which gives us the possibility to construct basic logic uh, processing units. Because if I put some electron here, I can perturb the other electron on purpose so that I can construct a gate that switches on and off and on and off. And out of this switch, we can construct um, computing chips. Now, it turns out that this very strong interacting nature of the electron is a double-edged sword. And a lot of you are already feeling it uh, now. You all have this uh, annoying experience that as you put laptop on your lap, it feels burning hot. And uh, when you use your cell phones, uh, it goes out of battery very, very quickly. And the basic reason is the very same reason why we have Moore's law. Because the, over the past 60 years, the basic design of a semiconductor chip did not change very much. So roughly speaking, per transistor, it dissipates the, roughly the same amount of heat. Now, if the number of transistors is increasing exponentially, so with the heat, it dissipates, uh, and it will go up exponentially. And this is the curve which plots uh, how much heat it is generated uh, by the intense operation of the electrons inside. So this is actually the problem. This is the most serious uh, uh, roadblock towards the Moore's law. That basically there's no way, so the, the amount of heat is generated so much that we cannot uh, suck the heat out of the semiconductor chip enough so that to keep the chip from uh, 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 normal operation. So if we examine exactly why it is so that electrons are causing so much heat, uh, we have to go to the very basic, go to deep inside uh, a semiconductor chip and find what exactly are the electrons doing. 
basically the electrons are moving like this. So we already said the electrons have this wonderful property that they interact with each other strongly. Therefore, we can con control them. We can construct logic gates and so on and so forth. But they also, as we pack these electrons closer and closer and closer in this relentless pursuit of the progress of the Moore's law, we're getting to the situation that the electrons are like cars moving in a crowded marketplace. They bump into each other. They bump into impurities. So the energy that we put into them by passing a current, get quickly dissipated into their surroundings. So it's literally like that that the electrons are moving. So this really looks like a, a very sad state of affair, that when you go inside, we all talk about this wonderful idea of an information superhighway. We indeed have, using photons, can connect remote parts of the world uh, with very little loss of information from one place to the other. But on the other hand, when we go to smaller and smaller units of the electrons, uh, we get into this uh, situation that the close packing caused this tremendous interference in a crowded uh, place, which now the chip uh, interior has become. So now you say a lot of times scientific progress are made just by analogy. Well, you say if this is the picture, what is the solution? I think all of you will immediately propose what is the solution. The solution should be this, right? So we should build a highway system for the electrons deep inside the chip at the very basic operational units of the semiconductor chip so that the electrons have this principle that we take for granted in a normal traffic environment of a highway, namely opposite moving traffic are spatially separated. This is the basic principle of a highway. And if this is the case, then the electrons on the right-hand side will be keep on moving, moving forward in a smooth traffic situation. And the electron moving towards you, that's why you see the headlight, uh, completely on the uh, other side of the lane. This way, they will completely avoid collisions uh, with each other. They will avoid dissipation. They will avoid this random state of motion of the electrons. This is the holy grail that we search in science today. Okay? And this is indeed the story that I would like to tell you about today. So this is indeed a moment of both crisis and opportunity. So in order to appreciate the magnitude of the significance uh, of this kind of discovery, let's move back into the chapters of history when transistors were first invented. Uh, of course, this picture on the left, I don't know whether any one of you uh, all recognize him. This is William Shockley. Uh, he invented, together with uh, Bardeen, at AT&T Bell Labs back in New Jersey, the basic transistor. And uh, they were awarded the Nobel Prize. It was a very important and significant uh, discovery in basic science. But then, for family reason, he needed to move back to California. He was a local boy here. And uh, Stanford University was quick to seize this opportunity. He came to the physics department at Stanford. And he was do both doing basic science, but also had the idea, wonderful idea, that why not turn this piece of basic science into technology as to change the way we process information. Because back then, we were processing information using vacuum tubes. And this was uh, what happened uh, when he first uh, came uh, into uh, Stanford, and this is uh, Silicon Valley now. So all the progress that we have today in Silicon Valley was due to this moment when science and te technology met at a crucial moment when a very important and basic idea uh, met uh, with practical applications and uh, uh, following that uh, with the relentless pursuit of semiconductor technology. So today, we're faced with a crisis. And as I said, that uh, when the, around the time when Gordon Moore uh, formulated uh, Moore's law, it was also the time when science and technology parted their way from each other. Uh, technology was uh, doing all of that. And to basic science, and I will tell you a little bit uh, about it, uh, going to more esoteric and exotic phenomena uh, into, uh, in, uh, into regimes which are quite far away from technology. But today's crisis, as we face today, is actually a wonderful moment that offers us an opportunity for science and technologies to converge back again. So sometimes in English, uh, this idea that crisis also means opportunity almost comes as, as an afterthought. 
but in some ancient language, uh, this is uh, deeply encoded. Uh, for example, in Chinese, uh, when we refer uh, Chinese uh, uh, words, uh, phrases are made out of uh, characters, and uh, the word crisis is made out of two characters, and the first, char uh, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, the first character means crisis, and the second uh, means opportunity. So these two are always uh, deeply interlinked uh, with each other uh, in an uh, ancient culture uh, with uh, such a deep uh, wisdom. Okay, so this is the um, uh, exciting moment that uh, we can uh, think back into how we uh, formulate and uh, completely design uh, the basic operation from scratch. And we already have a nice vision because we already see what the analogy could do because uh, uh, ever since the invention of the highway, how smooth our traffic system has become. So now, what is the science that's needed uh, to uh, realize uh, such a dream? So that, i like to tell you that in the basic science, there are two types of fundamental pursuits, okay? So ever since the time the Greeks formulated the idea of atom, there is a one relentless pursuit to find smaller and smaller building blocks of matter. So for example, in chemistry, uh, it was the search of new elements. After, the, uh, after we discover enough elements, uh, uh, we formulate the periodic table, and then we look for all the possible elements. These are the smallest possible building blocks of matter at that time. But it turns out later that it was not completely true, that there are uh, elements are made out of atoms, atoms are made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and they, those particles in turn are made out of the subatomic particles. So this gives the golden age of particle physics, and historically, the SLAC laboratory was constructed for this type of pursuit to find ever smaller building blocks of matter. However, there's also another type of pursuit in science, which is best explained by a very simple phrase of how does complexity arises from simplicity, okay? So we all have this experience that when we take the Legos, the basic building blocks of the Lego are very, very simple, but we can only marvel at the wonderful structures that our kids can construct out of these very basic building blocks. For, for example, in science, uh, we uh, have this uh, phenomena that uh, all of you know, that there's ice, water, and vapor. So they look very, very different, and they have very different, uh, uh, they're, they're just very different ones, uh, solid, liquid, and gas. But if you break them apart into the smaller building blocks, they are the same H2O molecule, okay? So that's the other type of science. One type of science is trying to find smaller and smaller building blocks, but now, after we find them, we look at the electron, we look at the proton, they're pretty simple. But how come is the world so complex? So there's another type of science which try to understand how does complexity emerges from such a simplicity of the building block. And that is the science that I mean. This is, uh, can be referred to as the solid state physics, or more generally, condensed matter physics, or material science. So for example, in the world of the electrons, uh, they can form uh, semiconductors, which are tremendously useful for all the information processing we do. Uh, we uh, also have magnets that the electrons can, uh, well, we discovered magnets very early on uh, uh, to use them as a compass, but today we can use magnetic properties as the basic storage units of information. We all face this tremendous problem of in, uh, energy crisis, but there's a wonderful material called superconductors. And there, the electrons can carry current without any loss. But uh, there's a little problem that it only works at relatively low temperature. So one part of the pursuit in my discipline is trying to find, for example, a superconductor that works at room temperature. And then you will really solve uh, our energy crisis uh, in a big way. But when you really take all of them apart, they're made out of the same protons. They're made out of the same electrons. So that's why there's another type of science that we, can under we try to understand how does the complexity of the world emerges from the simplicity of the building blocks. And uh, so, we, uh, so this is the how different states of matter uh, can emerge when you put these very simple building blocks together. And historically, actually, most of these uh, materials were discovered accidentally. But after we discovered them, we learned how to use them. 
But today, as we face this problem that I, I just alluded to you today, that there's this tremendous crowding of the electrons deep inside of the chip, we try to find a way to build a highway system for the electrons. So we need a new organizational principle to put the electrons into this highway system. And this is the discovery I'd like to tell you about today. So it goes with an interesting name, and so the name itself is quite suggestive. It's called topological insulator. Okay, so this uh, topology, I will explain a little bit later, refers to a deep and profound mathematical uh, concept. Uh, uh, insulator is a kind of a material, but basically, uh, just to take away the picture, if you want to remember one picture, these are the materials where inside of them, electrons move in a highway system. So the first material that's discovered uh, is, is basically a very, very thin layer of semiconductor material, which is sandwiched. So when it is a few atomic layers thick, we can basically think of them as two-dimensional because the, the, the height doesn't matter. It's only a few atomic layers. So this is a piece of material. Uh, it's a chemical composition. It's called mercury telluride. And there, the electron really move like in a highway system. So this is a, a, only a few atomic layers thick, and in the deep interior of this flat two-dimensional world, electrons don't go at all. And the electron only carry a current along the edge, and it has this wonderful property that the upspin electron, and I will explain the spin a little bit later, move around in a clockwise fashion, and the downspin electron move around in a counterclockwise fashion. So this is the basic cartoon picture of what is this new material or the new discovery is about. It's called topological insulator, but as a picture, you see that the electron is exactly moving in a highway-like system where counter-moving traffic are spatially separated into different lanes so that they can move in a regular fashion. So a little bit later, there are also three-dimensional materials. So these are regular bulk uh, materials, uh, which uh, has both a height uh, and uh, a linear dimension, and again, the electrons only move on the surface. They don't go to the interior parts of this material. So it's this material that gives us the wonderful control for allowing the electrons to move in this perfect highway system so that we can design the semiconductor chip completely from scratch and to completely and fundamentally solve the problem of dissipation as we face uh, as a roadblock to Moore's law today. Okay? So now how does this happen? So let's uh, imagine uh, that so we're driving a car on the highway. Uh, let's imagine that the highway is uh, very, very narrow, right? So if I drive a car and hit something, a lot of bad things can happen to me. My car can be, uh, can be dented. Uh, my uh, window glass can be shattered into pieces, but actually not for the electron. Because the electron is already the smallest possible unit, right? You cannot imagine that the electron bump into something and be shattered into even smaller pieces. So when you try to think about if the electron is moving in a very, very narrow lane, like a very, very thin one-dimensional wire, then it can either move forward or it can move backward. These two type of motion are still possible. You cannot break the electron because it's already the smallest unit. You cannot shatter the electron into pieces. But then when the electron hits some obstacle, the forward moving electron will be hit back. And that um, backward scattering is the cause for resistance. So if the electron was happily moving around the wire, but we can never, as we go to smaller, smaller dimension, construct a perfect wire. And if it hits some impurity, and I told you the electron interacts very strongly, then they will be immediately turned back. And that's how resistance uh, occurs. Because originally, you put in this energy, you want the electron to move forward, but somehow they don't listen to you, and they are moving back. So the solution, as we said, is to separate these two counter-moving traffic into one and one. So let's imagine now that we don't have a very thin, do we have a better pointer? Uh, so we don't just have a thin uh, one-dimensional wire, but we have now a two-dimensional flat system. So then we can arrange in a beautiful pattern so that the electrons on the upper side is moving forward, and the electron on the lower side is moving backward. So this is exactly the highway system. Because if that is possible, then if the electron hits an impurity, because we said the only possible way the electrons can do is to scatter back, but in order to scatter back, it has to jump all the way to the other side of the lane. This is very, very unlikely. So then, in this case, the electron will simply 
a veil around or go around this impurity and keep on going forward. So if there's only one type of motion possible for electron, then you will keep on moving forward without dissipation, problem solved. Except how do you conduct, uh, how do you tell the electrons uh, to follow these traffic rules? Here in the human society, we simply build a highway, we pass a traffic law, and then we move that way. So we have to find laws of nature which will direct the electrons to move that way. We have to find some uh, way so that the electrons can follow our will uh, and uh, to, to display this wonderful uh, pattern of motion. Now it turns out that this is possible, and, uh, but it was only possible due to an external agent, which is a magnetic field. So imagine I have this two-dimensional system, and on this two-dimensional system, I put perpendicular to this two-dimensional system a magnetic field. Okay? So a magnetic field gives a sense to the electron. What do I mean by that? So there's something called the right-handed rule. So if the magnetic field, uh, if I uh, put on top of this plane, is my thumb, and which is pointing in the uh, upwards direction, then my fingers uh, have, are executing this clockwise motion. So actually, if you have a magnetic field, the electron actually feels the magnetic field. So the magnetic field gives them a signal or a direction so that the electrons, all the electrons know that they should move around in a clockwise fashion. Okay? So this is what happens to the interior part of the electron. So for those of you uh, who know ballroom dancing of words, it's like they're just going through very simple box steps, going around and around, and they're not going very far away from each other. But now let's look at the electrons on the edge of the ballroom, what happens to them. Because they cannot compete, uh, complete a full circle. Because if they try to complete a full circle, they bump into the wall. So then they have to skip orbit and keep on moving forward. So these are more like the advanced dancers. They know how to make natural turns, reverse turns, and progressive turns. So they all go around. Now they, have, uh, they can execute a motion which is going all the way around the ballroom, unlike those in the middle who are just executing a very small circular motion. So this is actually the magic effect of the magnetic field. And it turns out this is possible uh, for the electrons to behave this way. And the discovery of that effect is called a quantum core effect, never mind the, uh, the words. But basically, in, in essence, it means that if we have an intense external magnetic field, the electrons do know that they can execute this clockwise motion. Now, it's clockwise and not counterclockwise because there's an externally imposed direction by the external magnetic field. So it tells the electron to move around in a clockwise fashion. And this way, according to this picture, the, uh, but the electrons deep inside, they don't do anything. They're just going around in circles. They don't carry any global current from one place to the other. So now, this is the, called the discovery of the quantized, quantum core effect uh, made in the 1980s. So this was exactly what I referred to when science and technology parted their way. Here in Silicon Valley, we're ob obsessed of using the computers, make it ever more powerful computers, and apply them to all sorts of interesting uh, higher level applications. But science, even though originally scientists, physicists invented the transistor, they, fl uh, they feel that there's not much they can contribute anymore because the engineers are so good once they learn the basic principle. So scientists went to explore these exotic phenomena. So why is this called an exotic phenomena? Because it requires a very high external magnetic field of 10 Tesla. Imagine you grab your laptop under a 10 Tesla magnetic field. Now, not only it requires a very high external magnetic field, it also at, it works at very, very low temperature. But this is actually good. Scientists should be left alone. They should be left alone to explore whatever they're interested in. If for the moment, scientists and technologists parted their way, this is just fine. But now that we face this crisis, we have to think again whether we can somehow use this effect, but without the extreme condition. If somehow this highway system can work without the intense external magnetic field and without the low temperature, then we can really change the world. Science is no longer exotic or esoteric anymore. What happened? <laughs> Something's out of power. <laughs> so
So we need something that replaces the external magnetic field, but yet something that can give a direction for the electrons to, so that they will know which direction around the ballroom they should work. And that brings us to another wonderful property of the electron, and this is called the spin of the electron. Oh, no, no, it is. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> but it's a different uh, format. We should uh, make it narrower. Uh, it's a little bit distorted. It's a stretched. But maybe we shouldn't touch it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, it is a wonderful effect. Actually, it was twice, uh, the discovery of which was twice awarded by the Nobel Prize. But it was a little bit exotic phenomenon. It requires very high external magnetic field and very, very low temperature. So we need to, scientists need to think about some way so that we replace the external magnetic field by something, but something still be able to give right to give a direction to the electron so that they know which way they have to dance around the bottom dance floor. And that brings us to the spin of the electron. So actually, it's quite easy to understand basic science if, because the nature works in a wonderful way that there's always analog analogies, okay? When you look at how electrons go around the atomic nucleus, it's very much like how the Earth goes around the sun, okay? So when the Earth goes around the sun, there are two types of motion. Okay, one is the Earth's center goes around the sun, and that goes once in a year, right? 365 uh, days. But the Earth also rotates by itself, and the rotation of the Earth by itself gives us the day, 24 hours, and the common motion of the center of the Earth around the sun uh, is what gives rise uh, to, the, to the year, okay? So now for the case of the Earth, actually these two type of motion, the spinning motion of the Earth and uh, the common motion of its orbital center around the, around the sun, so one takes one day and the other takes 365 days, does not seem to be so related to each other. But still, the electron has this property which is very similar to that of the Earth. Actually, quite a, I don't know uh, if uh, some of you think deeply look at uh, when you look into the stars, the moon is very different, okay? So the moon rotates by itself, it also goes around the Earth. So to Earth to the moon is a little bit like sun to the Earth. But the moon goes around the Earth in one month. It also rotates by itself in roughly one month. So we see in the case of the moon, the spinning motion or the self-rotation of the moon is coupled to its orbital motion. It's actually not an accident that these two periods are the same. 
Now, exactly what is the reason for it, it's actually a little bit complicated. It's due to something called a tidal force. In the early days, in the molten stage of the moon, uh, the moon was molten, there was some tidal force, and the tidal force leads to a coupling between the spinning motion and the orbital motion. But anyhow, uh, when we look even in uh, astronomical uh, objects, there's the idea that there's both the spin and there's the orbital motion, and there's a coupling between these two types of motion, at least in the case of the moon. What happened to the electron? Actually, Einstein's theory of relativity predicts that for the electrons, there's also such a coupling between the spinning motion of the electron and the orbital motion of the electron. Okay? So here I have depicted the center uh, of the orbit, which is a proton. Let's uh, take the simplest case of a hydrogen atom. So we have a proton, and the electron has a spin. Okay? And the spin actually generates a magnetic field. And if you align all the electron spin in a material, that's how you get a magnet. And uh, the spinning motion of the electron actually, according to Einstein, is always coupled to the orbital motion around the uh, atomic center of the atomic nucleus. So how do we understand? Uh, actually, this is much easier to understand uh, uh, why the moon has uh, such a coupling. Because Einstein always liked to play a game like this. He says, imagine that you are sitting on top of the electron. So usually when we look at this picture, it looks like, the, li li like we, uh, we always had this debate whether the Earth goes around the moon, uh, Earth goes around the sun, or the sun goes around the Earth. But Einstein was always very playful. He says, imagine that you are sitting on top of the electron. Then to you, it looks like, just like we observed, uh, that's why we were a little bit confused early on, that when we observe the nucleus, it looks like it's going around the electron. But the electron has a spin, so it generates a magnetic field. But if the nucleus goes around the electron, it generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field will tend to align the spin of the electron. So this is Einstein's explanation why, in the case of the electron, because the spin of the electron always generates a magnetic field, and uh, because the proton has a positive charge, when it goes around in a loop, it also generates a magnetic field. And that tends to align them together. Okay? So it is this effect which uh, gives us the possibility to completely remove the external magnetic field, because now the spin can give the direction to the electron which way to go. Okay? So this is the idea of the new discovery called quantum spin hole effect, uh, also called, sometimes called the topological uh, insulator. So basically, if we remember and put back the fact that the electron also have a spin, it, uh, in fact, it has two kind of spin. It can be spinning uh, with a North Pole pointing up, or it can be spinning in such a way that the North Pole is pointing down. So altogether, even in a very, very thin wire, the electron can have four types of motion. It can be spinning up or spinning down, or it can move forward or backwards. Uh, uh. But then you can use the spin of the electron to give the direction to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to its orbital motion. So in this case, uh, before previously, we used the external magnetic field and the right-handed rule to tell the electron whether to move clockwise or counterclockwise. But now we're using this wonderful effect called spin orbit coupling so that uh, when the electron is spinning up, it is going around the system in a clockwise fashion, and when it's spinning down, it's going around the system in a counterclockwise fashion. So just because of that, we get rid of the external magnetic field. Now the electrons, even though there's no external magnetic field, it knows which way to dance around the ballroom, whether clockwise or counterclockwise. But then, uh, what if the electron uh, hits some impurities? So now in this case, because the only the electron, these two, even though they're very close and they're moving in uh, opposite direction, they have different spinning direction. So it's very, very unlikely that when the electron is hitting some impurity, usually the impurity will not be able to flip the direction of the electron spin. That effect is not strong enough. So this type of motion, when electron hits some impurity and goes back, but at the same time turn, its spinning direction is very, very unlikely. So this is forbidden to occur. So as a result, we have this wonderful highway system that when the electron comes into an obstacle, it simply uh, views around and keeps on going forward. So this is actually a moment of very exciting discovery because it works, the principle at which it works is similar to what was discovered before in the quantum core effect 
where the electron, due to the external magnetic field, can move around the system, so, uh, like in a highway system, where they separate into different lanes. But now we have the possibility of completely removing the external magnetic field, so the electron how to move in this wonderful new highway system without much dissipation. And if this effect is used properly, maybe we can construct a much, much better chip uh, where your uh, cell phone will last for a month rather than a couple of hours. So now, where in the world do you discover such a wonderful material? So this uh, is a chart that actually, uh, I'm sure some of you here are engineers, and maybe some of you have seen this picture. So just like the chemists have a periodic table for the elements, uh, also uh, engineers and material scientists like to have a chart which organizes and put different materials together. And this is the way they put uh, things. So first of all, different uh, materials, uh, materials are made out of the atoms, the atoms have a distance uh, with respect to each other, and that's plotted on this axis here. But all these materials, the electrons inside, they move like quantum mechanical waves. So their energy uh, are not uh, all possible values are possible, so there are always some gaps in the energy. And it turns out that it's this kind of gap which makes this laser point possible. Because inside this laser point, there are some atoms, the electrons have some higher level, higher energy level, separated by forbidden region and lower energy level, and then when jump from higher level to a lower level, they emit some light of this given frequency. So this chart actually is very, very useful if you want to uh, construct something uh, which uh, takes uh, advantage of the solar light, you should always look at uh, elements of this region, right? Uh, uh, because uh, these uh, lights are compatible with the wavelengths of the solar spectrum. So this is kind of the periodic table of materials. And when you go to most material scientists, this is the thing you see. So now uh, I try to explain to you the excitement how scientific discoveries are made. So sometimes a discovery is made just by a pattern recognition. Okay? So when you look at this picture, there's something very strange. So it looks like all these materials have an energy gap, which I can explain a little bit more, but most people understand they can have an energy gap. And the energy gap tells you the color of the light this material can emit or absorb. But there's one very, very strange material called mercury telluride, which is, does not fit this overall picture at all. And this is in the negative axis. It has a gap which is, in some sense of definition, is negative. So now we know that uh, according to this uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, we said the electron can have this uh, spin-orbit coupling, but it will only have strong spin-orbit coupling heavy elements. Not only Einstein predicted qual uh, qualitatively there's such an effect, he also predicts the magnitude, the rough magnitude, and he says it scales with the atomic number to the fourth power. So when, by the moment you go to lower, lower part of the periodic table, when the atoms, elements are heavier and heavier, the effect of the spin orbit coupling gets stronger and stronger. So when we look at this picture, it's hard to believe of that all these materials are topological insulated, this wonderful uh, material, because then we could have discovered them accidentally. But there's one strange outlier, which is not very much used, and actually, at the time, we made our theoretical prediction. There's only one laboratory in the whole world that is investigating this, and that's in Würzburg, Germany. So this is the, this material called mercury telluride. And just by this pattern recognition, we see, aha, it has a very uh, heavy element, mercury, and uh, therefore, according to Einstein, it should have a very large spin orbit coupling, and just a kind of a bias that it's hard to believe all these materials are the wonderful topological insulator material. And then we said, aha, maybe we try this one first. And that's how we discovered the first topological insulator in the world. So now I need to explain to you a little bit uh, the picture, what do we mean by insulator and uh, metals. So basically, uh, electrons move inside the crystal like waves. And therefore, the waves filter their possible frequency or their possible energy, just like uh, you have a, a band filter in your uh, radius. Okay? So then the electrons move in this lattice, and they can only have certain range of energy. So these are depicted here, and these are called energy bands. And, so may, uh, and basically, what you do to the electrons is just like when you feel water. You feel these bottles by water. And if you partially feel one band, then you can kind of tilt the bottle, and then something will start to flow. That's the picture of the metal. Why the metals conduct electricity is due to this picture, that electrons are partially fill one bottle, and then you can tilt, and then something starts to flow. 
this is the picture of a metal. So if there's a picture of metal, some of you can already guess what's the picture of the insulator. And this will be a completely filled bottle, right? So if the bottle is completely filled, then no matter how you tilt it, nothing is going to flow. You cannot generate a flow by something that's completely filled. So as a result, the electron inside the insulator, they all move around by very small steps around the atomic nucleus. They cannot go in a very large distance. Just like when you tilt the bottle here, it doesn't uh, uh, lead to a uh, flow of the water. So what is a topological insulator in this picture then? So a topological insulator in this picture is more like an hourglass. So it basically has this upper region where it's the allowed energy for the electron and the lower region, which is also the allowed energy for the electron. But these are the energy allowed for the electron in the interior part of the material. It, looks, uh, it turns out that when you go to the boundary of the material, then there's some energy that's allowed. And these energies continuously connect the upper one, this is called a conduction band, and the lower one, which is called a valence band. And this is the picture of the topological insulator. It's as if you tie the knot between uh, these two bottles so that you always get a state when the electron, now in this case, the electron cannot flow if you put a few of the water up to this point. They cannot, in the interior part of this material, it's very much like the picture here, but on the surface of it, they can move freely. So this is kind of the wonderful property of the highway system that we see after. And now we have uh, a material, and uh, we now need to do uh, some experiments. So uh, by the way, so I'd like to tell you that uh, physics is a very international endeavor. So we uh, at Stanford University, uh, we, part, uh, we uh, were the major contributor to develop this basic idea of a topological insulator, but we also predicted explicitly this material. And now, uh, uh, we, I told you that there's only one laboratory in the whole uh, universe and in the whole world uh, that uh, makes this material mercury territe. It's uh, in Würzburg, Germany, uh, under Professor Lawrence Molenkamp. So we designed the experiment to test. So basically, if you have an ordinary insulator, if you feel an uh, ordinary uh, situation here, if you feel the water here, it's a metal. It conducts electricity. When you measure uh, the conductivity of the system, it conducts current. But when you feel the water all the way up to here, it will not feel uh, any conductance. So uh, just the picture I have explained earlier, that no matter how you tilt your bottle, nothing can flow. So if you put, uh, <coughs> if you feel the water here and measure the resistance of your material, it will be almost infinite, or it does not conduct at all. But when you feel the electron up to this point, then it can conduct uh, electricity again. So this is the conventional picture, which is valid for semiconductors like silicon, gallium arsenide, and so on. They all have this property. So now, what happened to this wonderful new material called topological insulator? As I explained, that it ordinarily has a conduction band and a valence band. But uh, by the time you get to mercury territe, it has such a strong spin-orbit coupling that it inverts these two bands. So this, what was, what was previously a valence band became a conduction band. What was previously a conduction band becomes a valence band. But after this inversion, you have this state which only lives on the boundary or the edge of the system. So these are the lengths of the highway that we have. And so, so as then our colleague uh, put the water level up to this point here, they find that the electrons don't conduct at all. So this is this uh, <coughs> ballroom dancing picture. That, but if you measure the uh, conductance, there's still some channels of conductance, but they're only on the edge. But uh, furthermore, how much they conduct does not depend on how wide this uh, channel is. And that is kind of a picture that is really going uh, around in this uh, highway system. So now, if uh, we always want in uh, science some kind of a direct evidence the electrons are really moving in this highway system, and that is a recent experiment done by my colleague Catherine Muller at Stanford. Basically, if the current is flowing, it generates a magnetic field. By measuring the profile of the magnetic field, you can actually see uh, how the currents are distributed. And as she took this uh, measurement of the magnetic field, she uniquely infers that the currents are really moving in these tiny lengths and only in one direction. So this is uh, kind of the wonderful discovery uh, of the topological insulator. So we were able to predict by looking at this graph, we were able to predict which material will have this property. And when my experimental colleagues in a wonderful collaboration uh, worked on it, they indeed find that this is true. So now, 
we basically solved one problem, but there's still another problem remaining. So I said, this highway system could work uh, from previous principles, but at that time, we need a high magnetic field and low temperature. So f using this spinning degree of freedom of the electron, we completely got rid of uh, the external magnetic field. It's no longer needed, uh, but then uh, we still have this uh, fact that this effect still works at a relatively low temperature. So we would like to get rid of all extreme conditions. No more external magnetic field, which we already solved, but also to have something that works at room temperature. So this material were predicted, mercury terrorite, has all these wonderful highway property, but still at relatively low temperature. So we need to look for new material. But very recently, uh, we predicted a new material, and we also coined a new buzzword called the stunning. Okay? So the element of tin, uh, when you look at the periodic table, its chemical symbol is SN, not something like TN, but SN. So SN is Latin. It stands for stunning. So if we make a single atomic layer of it, and copying the idea some of you may have heard of graphene, which is a single layer of carbon, so we call this stunning. Stannin, uh, because of the element, but something nin means a single uh, atomic monolayer. They actually form a beautiful honeycomb-like crystal, and we predict that in this system, because tin is pretty low in the periodic table, so its spin orbit coupling is very strong, so we can get rid of the external magnetic field, but also, furthermore, it has a very large energy gap. So it has an energy gap 10 times higher than room temperature. So it can work perfectly at room temperature. So this is kind of the new uh, wonderful material. Uh, and if it's, uh, the dream is realized, we propose to change the name of Silicon Valley to King Valley. <laughs> so now there are also other materials uh, discovered, but uh, generally, according to this uh, principle that Einstein uh, formulated that uh, it always happens, this effect happens in heavy elements where spin orbit coupling is strong. Uh, we focus on this region and we predicted some other material called uh, bismuth selenite, bismuth terrorite, and they all have this property that you have a conduction band and a valence band, but then some surface state which kind of connects these two usually disconnected bands together so that the uh, electrons can flow uh, in this uh, surface current fashion. So now how do you really verify uh, this picture experimentally? So this is here the SLAC laboratory uh, comes in. So we uh, can actually do an experiment where you come in with a photon and kick out the electron, and you can see in this experiment uh, that how the electrons behave. And basically, these are the electron states, as we can see uh, in this so-called photo emission experiment, how they behave, and they indeed behave as predicted uh, in this theoretical work that they connect the conduction and the valence band uh, at a single point, uh, uh, which is like a knot that you tie between these two states. So now this was the experiment that has been done. But the beauty of this subject, topological insulator, is that not only it can be tremendously useful, it's also a laboratory to, interest, uh, to study interesting and curious phenomena. So these days it gets harder and harder to explore uh, uh, higher energy particles uh, because you need to build a huge laboratory uh, here at SLAC. We no longer can afford to build the next generation accelerator because the real estate here is simply too expensive. But sometimes you can construct an analog baby universe kind of situation. So inside topological insulator, there's a one particle which we always have been looking for that we never was able to find, and this is called magnetic monopole. So we all know that electron carry a single unit of charge, but all magnets have both a North Pole and South Pole. We have never ever discovered uh, uh, something that only has a North Pole and not a South Pole. But on the surface of topological insulator, we predict that uh, you may remember that uh, in, uh, usually in textbook in high school, it's taught that if you put an electron above some surface, you can in, uh, generate an image charge. But we predict that if you put an electron on top of topological insulator, the image it's a magnetic monopole, not an ordinary electron charge. So this effect has yet to be seen, and if it's uh, observed, it was a wonderful way to show how, how topological insulator is a host to all these exo uh, exotic particles. Now let me finally explain to you what this magic word topology means. Okay? So this is a concept derived in mathematics, and it's a very, very interesting uh, concept. So 
uh, you all know uh, geometry uh, as a basic, uh, even the Greeks have uh, founded uh, geometry. And as the highlight of their discoveries are the platonic solids. So let me use those to explain to you. So the platonic solids are the best example of the beauty of geometry, of this geometrical object. When you look at this object, you all have a deep sense of beauty associated with their symmetry. So they're all formed of this regular polygon glued up together to form a polyhedra so that they all meet at these vertices, they all share edges, and so on. So this is, uh, these are beautiful, beautiful objects, and there are only five of them, and this uh, Plato, uh, Plato uh, is tremendously inspired by them, okay? But uh, beauty, as, uh, as derived from symmetry, is also fragile, okay? Sometimes beauties are. And uh, now you have uh, these uh, vertices, and if you misplace them slightly, this beauty of the platonic solid are no longer there. So because the beauty is only a result of the symmetry associated with these geometrical objects. So then mathematicians have thought about and thought about, they have another, their sense of beauty has evolved. And they want to find something, find beauty in things that are simple and universal. So they ask uh, themselves, if I distort the vertices to very strange corners and uh, randomly add another vertices, are there some things which I can still say that's both simple and universal? And that was discovered by Leonid Euler, one of the greatest math mathematicians of all the time. And it's very, very simple to state. So when you have these objects, you can count how many vertices there are, how many edges there are, and how many faces are there are. So if you form this combination, Euler observed that always give you a number of two. So for example, if you take the tetrahedra, it has four vertices, six edges, and four faces. If you form this combination, give you two. If you take the cube, it has eight vertices, 12 edges, and six faces. If you form this combination, it also always give you two. In fact, it doesn't have to be a platonic solid. You can distort it in any arbitrary shape. And you can try to have a look at your soccer ball or anything like that. So as long as it's kind of a polyhedra approximation to the surface of a sphere, this relationship always holds. So this is the moment when the wonderful field of topology was discovered in mathematics. In a way, it's an evolution of a sense of beauty that as you destroy the beauty associated with the symmetry, there's still something that's even more deeper, profound. And this is a quantity which we now call a topological invariant. And that's associated with the idea that's very robust. No matter how you distort it, this relationship always holds true. But actually not all the time, because I gave a condition that as long as you have a polyhedral approximation to the surface of a sphere, what if you do a polyhedral approximation to the surface of a donut? Then in this case, it's not true. And when you form this combination, it gives you zero. Okay? So in fact, you can have a donut with two holes and three holes and so on. And Euler discovered that this combination always gives you two minus two times the number of holes, which in mathematics is called genus. So this is the day when the idea of topology was founded in mathematics. And today, it's the most advanced and admired branch of mathematics. Some of the deepest conjecture are coming out of uh, topological uh, uh, branch of mathematics. And some of you may know that one of the conjecture was only proven recently. A three-dimensional generalization of this picture called the Poincaré conjecture was only, it's a conjecture in topology and only proven recently, okay? So now, uh, when we look at, uh, in some uh, interesting art, uh, artworks, uh, you see uh, similar things. So I mean, you may know uh, Yuri Milner. Uh, he is now a, a part-time local resident here, uh, famous for uh, early investor of uh, Facebook. And he recently founded a new science prize, okay? So being something new, he always had need to find a differentiator. So instead of inviting the king of Sweden uh, to be the master of ceremony, he invited uh, Morgan Freeman. So I was uh, uh, deeply humbled to receive the prize for the discovery of uh, topological insulator. But my greatest uh, present uh, was that the trophy was actually a topological object, okay? So when you look at the trophy, it's very interesting. From a distance, it looks like a sphere. But when you observe in detail, actually the North Pole and South Pole are connected. So actually, it's a topological trophy. It's not an ordinary <laughs> trophy. So, uh, so now we classify different objects according to how many holes there are, and this is a topological invariant, as I explained earlier. So now if you apply this to all systems, what is the topological invariant? 
it turns out it's exactly the number of the highway lanes. Okay? So not only you can build this highway lane as one single lane highway, but you can build multiple ways, but the number of highway lanes is a topological invariant. Now why is this cool and important? Because topological invariants, as I explained, is robust. And this is exactly what we need today in electronics. We need something that's robust. That as you, I put impurities to all sorts of violence to it, there's something that always stays the same, doesn't change. And that is the number of lanes. And that's the wonderful property of topology as we borrow the concept from mathematics. So just to illustrate, uh, uh, if I have ordinary coding of an insulating surface by a metallic layer, it rusts very uh, quickly. Uh, but uh, if you have a topological surface, if it reacts with the atmosphere, it's very, very robust. Even if the top surface may disappear, it simply sinks down a little bit. Okay? So this is the magic for topological insulators. So in fact, diamonds are not forever. They degrade. But these topological surface states are forever. <laughs> so uh, now what are the applications we already talked about? These are the a wonderful highway system we can build in electronics so that we can have this interconnect between the different, not only we can build better chips, we can also connect different parts of chip without almost any loss. Just imagine for those of you who are coming from the semiconductor industry, we went through a transition from aluminum wire to copper wire. That was a tremendous thing. But that to a scientist is just some incremental change, aluminum to uh, copper. But someday, I hope that we will make these topological interconnects uh, using these uh, uh, <coughs> topological insulators, and they will really transmit uh, information without any loss inside the chip. And that actually, to our great surprise, was already recommended by the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. Another application is in the energy space. So our society generates a huge amount of waste heat. Using this kind of material, we can possibly turn waste heat into useful electric energy. Also, the reverse holds true, that if we want to refrigerate something, we can simply apply a current without any moving parts, and it can lead to refrigeration. So these are the things which are still being actively invested as possible application for topological insulator. Maybe uh, something which is a lot fancier uh, is the idea of quantum computing. So these days, you all know that uh, any time you buy something uh, uh, on Amazon uh, or in any electronic commerce, you need to encrypt your message. And all encryption system is based on the difficulty of solving some mathematical puzzles. And one of the puzzle is called prime factoring. So if you give, I give you a number like 15, it's very easy for most of you here to factorize this into 3 times 5. If I give you two huge numbers, it's still relatively easy to multiply them and to get another huge number. But if I give you one huge number and ask yourself whether it's a composite of two factors, a multiplication of two numbers or not, like this number which I randomly typed on my keyboard, it's very, very hard to figure out. So the difficulty in solving this kind of problem scales exponentially with the number of digits uh, uh, in, the <coughs> in, in, uh, in the problem. But uh, people dreamed about this idea of quantum computer, which can solve these problems in a, in a split second, in a, in a fashion which we call linear fashion, that it doesn't scale exponentially with the number of digits, but only linearly. And this is the idea of quantum computers, but the problem is quantum computers are also very fragile. But now you see the idea of topology comes in. The topology is the idea that you can build robust things. In fact, we, in, when we build anything in engineering, we like to build robust things that are immune to little mistakes. And this is indeed the idea, that if we build using this topological material, we can actually succeed in building these quantum computers, which can be uh, able to solve problems which was previously impossible to solve. So we're really in a very exciting period in time. And just to put this into a historical context, materials has basically defined our civilization, right? So we have uh, all the important ages of civilization are named after the materials of the usage. The Stone Age, use of stone, and to the glory of the Bronze Age is maybe best illustrated by these uh, beautiful uh, uh, bells discovered in China during the Bronze Age, and then we move to the Iron Age and to the Silicon Age. So as we search for the new materials which can carry us to the next generation of the Moore's Law, uh, we are indeed engaged in this exciting search 
and that was the story uh, I was uh, going to tell you about today. Uh, and so this is the topological insulator. It really uh, was born out of beautiful ideas in mathematics, and it could very well be, uh, indeed has this property that as, we, as you hear it, I hope not only uh, you take my word for it, but it should come as obvious that we should, as uh, we go into the uh, bottom layers of the semiconductor device, we should build a highway system for them rather than letting them go in this randomly clouded fashion. And so we also have found novel applications, not only in electronics and in energy. But just to make one remark, which, may, uh, which is different from everything that was discovered previously. We have discovered many, many useful materials before. But most of the time, in the past, they were discovered serendipitously, which is a fancy word of discovering them accidentally. But today, we are trying to save Moore's law. We try to find new materials. But fortunately, we can use Moore's law to save Moore's law, because the tremendous computing power help us to predict and design material properties. And when combined with beautiful concepts out of mathematics, we have a new way and a new path towards material discovery. Thank you very much. the evening. Uh, before, before you ask, make sure that you have a microphone in front of you because we're recording the questions as well as the answers. And uh, with that, I open it to the public. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. Hello. So uh, the five materials that you were experimenting with, the standing and the four other ones, Yeah. where do you get those? Are they commercially available? Yeah. Or? So uh, it, like the bismuth terrorite, uh, they are commercially available, but not to the level of purity that most uh, scientists want. Mercury terrorite, uh, I believe, exists in compound form, but we don't use those uh, three dimensional. We need to make thin atomic monolayers. Uh, or a few quintuple layers. So these are made by a technique called molecular beam epitaxy, MBE, most of these material. And the single atomic layer stannin uh, is also proposed to be made in this technique. Basically, you shoot atomic guns to form these structures layer by layer. Now you mentioned the quantum Hall effect. Yeah. And now you get rid of the field and yeah. you change the temperature. Yeah. You, is there an equivalent of a fractional charge? In ah, the very, very good. Yeah. This is uh, <laughs> the very frontier of the research. Uh, people are trying to find fractional topological insulator, fractional quantum spin hole. Not being found yet, but theoretically proposed. Yeah. We have additional questions? Ah, yes. Thank you. Uh, as, as circuits shrink, you have a problem called electron tunneling. Does this prevent it, or does it bypass it? Yeah, actually, uh, there, there are uh, quantum tunneling. Sometimes you can use them for uh, constructive purposes as trying to make an on-off switch uh, to these materials. But they are localized near the edge in a very, very thin fashion that it's not the dominant problem in this uh, new vision. Can you, can you predict roughly how, when this can be a reality? So Silicon Valley become a, not Silicon Valley anymore? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I think uh, we are really in a very exciting time. And uh, uh, I think it can go really change the world. Uh, yeah, so, but there's still a lot of research that needs to happen. But uh, usually, the vision has to be clear. And uh, as far as the vision is concerned, it's a clear vision. That, uh, and uh, then the rest, we just work hard. A lot of times, we're searching in the dark. But I'm happy to tell you that we're not anymore. 
Yeah. So uh, what is the killer application? Which means you know you predict which one will be the first one that actually yeah. beat up other conventional uh, yeah. methods. So just uh, yeah, well, it uh, may not sound as uh, sexy as you want, uh, but uh, just I told you that uh, just the transition from aluminum wire to copper wire, there was a huge uh, uh, yeah uh, paradigm shift in the semiconductor industry. So I, I say that even to replace the interconnects by topological insulator will already change the face of semiconductor industry forever. Hi, um, two questions. One is, what kind of, or do you have current density concerns when you know, you're running these uh, electron highways? How much current can you pack in there? Is there a some kind of limit where they start to get so dense they break apart or yeah, yeah. whatever? Yeah, yeah. So actually, because we're looking for low voltage application anyhow, mm -hmm. so current density, again, is not an important issue. So this also enables you to operate them at low voltage. So. All right, my second question is, I'm just curious, when do you think, uh, do you have an estimation for when the standing product would, or not product, but yeah. uh, so material actually, would yeah. be made? Yeah, yeah, uh, so, so far, uh, everything we predicted theoretically uh, were verified or confirmed experimentally. So uh, I, I hope that be partly because of these, that, uh, and I know for, for a fact that a lot of labs around the world are trying it. So once we have this room temperature, dissipationless transport in the absence of any external magnetic field, I think it's really time that it will take off. So far, I think the progress, the concepts are all there but it's a little bit slow because the temperature was, is still an issue. Uh, is this being proposed as a low dissipative interconnect primarily, or are you switching also? In yeah, the so we try to take a two-pronged approach. So right now, in the semiconductor industry, the problem with the interconnect and the dissipation associated with the interconnect is already so severe that it has been proposed that inside the chip, not in far distant, inside the chip, the tiny chip, that they use optical interconnects. But that is really, I think, uh, not a reasonable thing to do because we have a solution which is all electronic. We're using some new principle of the electron, but still using the electron. The, the, the overhead to convert the electrons into photon and back and forth, that I think is a, has no future. Yeah. So I think the previous question touched on this. Uh, would this be useful as a switching mechanism as well? Yes. In some way? Yes. And yes. would that make the, the switches smaller or just simply yeah, smaller make the dissi and dissipation uh, less? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay. Which uh, will solve both the problem at the switch level and at the interconnect level. All right. Thank you. Is there any uh, uh, hurdles we're going to have to overcome in terms of the lithography and you know the building of the circuits that do you know that you can comment on uh, yeah so I'm of course uh, more a scientist than a technology person but uh, when we first proposed the mercury territe a lot of people are pretty concerned because it's a material which is not so commonly used has a lot of uh, properties which may not be all in advantage to us but uh, stannin and tin looks it's a very abundant material. It's a friendly material. And uh, we have been making ca uh, carbon monolayers. Why not tin monolayers? So, uh, and uh, like the carbon monolayer has been mass produced already. So, so I think uh, it will come. It, it's, it's not a sure stop. Yeah, I'm just a little confused about where you are with the temperature issue. Could you yeah. elaborate on that yeah. just a tiny so bit more? Yeah, so with the temperature issue, uh, yes, the, uh, with the early generation of materials that were predicted, they work at low temperature. There's another material in the arsenide, gallium antimonite, which has been experimentally confirmed to work above liquid nitrogen temperature, but still low temperature. But stunning is predicted to work perfectly at room temperature, but it's a theoretical prediction. So I'm only and making this claim based on the past record of success we had so far. Yeah, yeah, it's going to work. Yeah. But it's also tell you that we'll really tell you about things which are happening as we speak. So somebody should do an interesting Google track of this buzzword, <laughs> stunning. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
With that, I'd like to thank all of you for your patience with our projector issues, as well as the patience of our speaker. And uh, one more time, let's thank our speaker and have a safe and pleasant evening. Thank you. Sandy Fetter student. Long Sandy time. Fetter, oh, yeah. great. So I knew a little bit. But I'm just curious, because there's too many questions, but if you cool it, do they superconduct on the no. surface? No, it's a different mechanism. It's, it's a different.